Hello and welcome to In Conversation with Rashmi. Today, my guest in conversation is Steve Seftil, who is a Canadian retired hockey forward and author who played four games with the Washington Capitals during 1990-91 NHL season. The former National Hockey League player was drafted in the second round, 40th overall by the Capitals in 1986 NHL entry draft. Steve Seftil slashes the stigma of mental illness in sports by speaking up in his book, Shattered Ice, after being a silent sufferer for almost 35 years. Thank you so much, Steve, for being a part of this conversation. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Hello, Rashmi, and uh, I'm glad we could finally work this out. We had some plans before COVID-19 to get together. So I'm glad that uh, through this different, it's a new world for all of us that we were able to, to do this chat together online. And originally we planned to go to your studio, but this is- I know, fun. I'm glad it worked out and you know, the timing worked out. So I'm just gonna go right into what the book said. And I did read, my whole family is reading the book. So it's a fabulous book you have written. But 35 years is a very long time to suffer with mental health. So take me back to the early days of, you know, where your hockey journey even began. Sure. I grew up in Kitchener, Ontario. And like many other kids before me, you know, the, the local schoolyard rink was the place where we kind of played out our dreams about maybe one day playing in the National Hockey League or perhaps, but even long before that, just enjoying the sport of hockey and playing with your friends being outside fresh air and doing something you really enjoy to do so i grew up on brandon avenue in kitchener um i went to monsignor gleason catholic school but uh, we played hockey upon hockey on the the rink at westmount public school over on glasgow street um so it's great memories of that and um i also have fond memories of playing I'm dating myself, but playing on the, the pond or lake at Victoria Park. Back mm -hmm. in the day, that lake would freeze at Victoria Park, and we were permitted in those days to skate on it and play shinny hockey. <laughs> and that was another favored gathering spot for that. Um, yeah, I was a graduate of Kitchener Minor Hockey. Played all my minor hockey in town here in Kitchener. Kitchener really was a hockey hotbed, and still mm -hmm. is. And a great community, lots of support. And again, terrific coaches I played for and fond memories of those days. And when did you realize that something was not okay, something didn't fit in with what you were battling with yourself and playing hockey at the same time? Because with all those years of playing hockey, you then went on to be selected in the NHL with the Washington Capitals. So tell me about that. Well, I'll give you a, uh, yeah, a couple stories that um, I remember feeling a little different for the first time mentally. Uh, when I was 16, our, my Kitchener midget team went to Czechoslovakia, and that's a chapter in Shattered Ice about that trip to then communist Czechoslovakia. And I got trapped in an elevator, and that was the first time I suffered a panic attack. But that might cause a lot of people to be anxious and panic being stuck in an elevator in a foreign country at 16 years old. But I remember the sweat just pouring down my face instantaneously after being trapped in this elevator. And I do walk you through that story in the book. That was the first time I really felt like something odd happened where I was completely out of control of my inner self. Mm -hmm. And then if I jump ahead a year, uh, I was drafted by the Kingston Canadians of the Ontario Hockey League in 1985. And I all this, also tell this story where a part of junior hockey is you get billeted. And what billeted is means is you you live with a family while you're away from home. True. So you're, in, a, in a lot of cases, you're moving away at 15, 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. You're just in your teens, and those are very formative years. And now you're living with a family who prior to coming to the city, you did not know. And I remember my parents dropping me off for training camp in Kingston that first year, I was 17. Going up to my bedroom, I tell this story in the book as well, and I'm in a, a stranger's home. I'm gonna be living in this house. My parents have went back to Kitchener after dropping me off. 
I close the bedroom door. I have this big blue cumbersome looking suitcase. And I just sat on the bed and stared at the suitcase and then started looking at the surroundings and being overwhelmed. I remember being overwhelmed by the situation and tears kind of developing in my eyes and realizing that, you know, I, I was scared. I mean, you are, but I was there to play hockey. And one thing about hockey players and maybe athletes, but hockey players, that's what I play. So I know we are very good at car compartmentalizing. So I turned all the feelings off instantly because I knew why I was there. So you, you end up suppressing everything because you don't want to be seen as weak and you soldier on. That's the way you're, we're groomed from a young age, especially at the elite hockey levels. And you didn't share what you went through with any of your other players or coaches. You didn't bring it up with anybody at that time. I did not, and as I mentioned just a moment ago, you never want to be seen as mentally weak. I mean, we promote a culture of being mentally tough mm -hmm. and showing weakness or portraying that you're not mentally strong was never encouraged. Mm -hmm. Nobody was talking about mental illness or mental health at all. I will share with you, in my second season in Kingston, um, I was suffering from a lot of internal stress and anxiety that was manifesting itself in a number of symptoms. And I did go to the team physician, a family doctor, well, team doctor, not my family doctor is in Kitchener, mm -hmm. but I went to one of the team doctors who is a general practitioner, explained my symptoms that I was suffering from. And I, I'll never forget when, he, when I left, he said, I can't find anything wrong with you just before letting me walk out the door. Mm -hmm. So the message I got that day was, okay, this is just who I am. There's nothing wrong with me because I've been told they can't find anything wrong with me, so I just have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really from that point on, I turned all that, those feelings went inward, and I've never shared them again until 2018. Mm -hmm. And... The reason you started writing this book, when did you decide it was time to put what you went through in a book and why did you start writing? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. So in my wife, over the years, my wife suspected something was wrong with me and she had asked me to go for counseling different times and um, being a true athlete and maybe a male, I just refused any help. And it was, no, I can handle this on my own. And I always pushed that away and uh, said, I, I can handle it. I can deal with it. Then in January of 2018, mm -hmm. I suffered what I call a mental, I call it a mental breakdown because I think people kind of understand that term or can have a, an idea of what that means. But I couldn't get out of bed. I didn't want to get out of bed. My body completely shut down on me. Um, my joints started to swell. It was a very scary time and I didn't know what was wrong. Well, I, I knew inside I was a, in complete turmoil, mm -hmm. but I'd never had an official diagnosis. So I started going for therapy. Finally, at my wife, again, my wife said, this is enough. And not too long before that, I'd had a point where I'd probably reached rock bottom. She said, you know, this is enough of this. You need to seek help and I'm not going to let you say no anymore. Mm -hmm. almost an ultimatum in some ways that if you don't get help then you know we're gonna have problems mm -hmm. so I agreed and I started to go for help uh, get some treatment and I remember one of the first things two things in particular that my therapist said to me she said you know if you don't if you suppress feelings for many many years three things can happen you can implode hurt yourself you can explode hurt others or you get physically sick in my case, I was getting physically sick from suppressing all these feelings for so, so many years. So I went off work originally for six weeks. And what happened, though, is my boys were older. My oldest son was a Toronto firefighter. My younger son is in university. My wife's working. Now I'm home alone with this spiraling mind. And I was still really struggling. So I started writing the book as a way to keep me preoccupied. Okay. 
and it, it, it that's what it did like I, I treated it like a job I would uh, drive I got in this routine of driving my wife to work in the morning and then I would go home and write 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 all day long and pick her up at the end of the day at five and then we'd be together in the evening but the silence during the day was just eating me up and the book took me to another place did you revisit the dark places that you had been through with writing this book and how did you cope with that because one thing is when you've lived that and you've gone past those faces and then now you're writing them and putting them out there so what did you feel when you were revisiting those dark areas again uh, a lot of anger came out and frustration the feelings i had never dealt with mm -hmm. that i had suppressed and buried all came out and I, I, that's a good another short story i'll share with you is that i did have an editor who a family member who who agreed to help me as a reader to try to get me to dig a little deeper with the writing mm -hmm. and i remember one thing she said to me early on in the writing as some of this venom or anger was coming out she said to me this is really dark after reading a few chapters and she said is this the story you want to write she said it's okay if you do but you just need to know that as a reader i'm telling you this is really dark mm -hmm. and i thought it wasn't the story i wanted to tell i wanted it to be about the joy of hockey and of the sport and even though it took me to some of those frustrating places on the journey of playing hockey, the sport still deep down, I loved it and I needed to find that love again. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it to be positive and I changed kind of the direction and, and made it more about the people, the places, the stories. So I still share the, some, I still share my struggles in the story. Mm -hmm. And the, from that side, it became very cathartic for me really digging deep and visiting those places that were challenging. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, I acknowledge the coaches, the players, the friends, the incredible opportunities and relationships I had. For sure. And talking about the opportunities and the game itself, what was it like when you found out you were selected on an NHL team? Oh, well, uh, that's the story I don't, I love telling. <laughs> um, the, the 1986 NHL draft was in Montreal at the, the original forum in Montreal. And um, my parents and I took the train there from Toronto along with my agent and uh, his other clients. And we went down to the forum and I was picked in the second round by the Washington Capitals, 40th overall. And to walk up on that stage in that venue at the forum and pull a jersey over your head mm -hmm. is just one of the most incredible, memorable feelings of my career, absolutely. And, and standing up on the stage and looking out at the assembled people, and my, I had this smile that grew and grew and, and really didn't go away for uh, quite some time that day. I'm sure. <laughs> And I, I have this line in my book where I said, I say there's, there's an incredible feeling that comes from putting that jersey on and basically that team is saying to the world, we believe in you. And draft day is about hope. Mm -hmm. There's a hope for the future and what might be, even though many drafted players never play in the National Hockey League. But on draft day, everybody's got that hope and dream that, of what's come to come so it's a it's a fun day and, and, a, and a really exciting day and uh, certainly one I'll never forget for sure and how important is was it for you to have the kind of support you did even today when you've written this book and you're having your family and friends support you and be by your side sharing your journey be it you know playing an NHL game or sharing your mental health journey or to writing this book today. What's that been for you and what does that mean to you? Oh, it's been remarkable over the last 12 months. You know, one of the struggles I had and one of these symptoms that came with my mental illness is I pushed everybody away. 
-hmm. I never felt uh, like I belonged or was worthy. And that was my, my, was my head talking. Mm -hmm. And I pushed a lot of the hockey family and some of my own family members away because I always thought I didn't achieve what they expected me to achieve. And you know, it's more about who you are as a person, not uh, as a hockey player. And I missed that along the way with my, some of my mental health struggles. But about a year ago, I'll, I'll just give another story is the forward for the book is written by my former coach, Doug McLean, mm -hmm. who is a well-known media uh, hockey commentator in this country. Mm -hmm. He coached me in, in Baltimore and he was always my favorite coach. I, mean, I have lots of great coaches, but Doug McLean was my favorite. Mm -hmm. And as I was, the book was coming to a conclusion, I thought I would get someone to write a forward. I thought that'd be a real icing on the cake. And I, th I couldn't think of a better person than my favorite coach. And I do write about him in the book and the time we spent together in Baltimore. And I called him up and within, so I called an old Baltimore sports reporter who has number. Mm -hmm. And I said, can you get me in touch with Doug McLean? He says, sure. He texts me five minutes later and says, he's waiting for your call. Wow. Yeah. And I was just blown away. I said, wow. So I called him, we had a nice chat. I caught him off guard. We hadn't spoken years. And uh, you know, he's, he was still in the league for many years after, and I was back in Canada. And he invited me down to Toronto, and we met for lunch. Mm -hmm. And he agreed to write the foreword, which was just remarkable. But it, it, it really made me realize that day how I had pushed so many people away and how they were still there for me. I was the one who was pushing them away. They weren't pushing me away. And by reconnecting, that was just the start of uh, – an amazing year it's been of reconnecting with old family and friends and ex-teammates and it's been a, a real journey the last 12 months mm -hmm. and back in the 80s the stigma on mental health was you know at a different level altogether and today also there is another level of you know stigma that still exists after all these years so what would your message for you know people players especially who have that thing where you know we have to be strong we cannot look weak that still exists even in today's time so what's your message for them the message is to be able to talk about it talk to your friends talk to your family talk to your medical practitioner and don't be afraid to speak that to say those words i, I can tell you when i first was diagnosed with uh, panic disorder and anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even say the words, mm -hmm. not to friends, not to family. I, I felt so apprehensive about saying it. I almost would stammer over this, I would stutter over the words because I couldn't get it out because it was, that's a stigma. It was just wasn't, in my mind, accepted language. Mm -hmm. And the more I said it, and the more I told my story, the more comfortable I got with it. And people would open up to me. Then they'd say, oh, I know someone in my family who's suffering. But I'm so happy you talked. You were able to speak about it because now I can go home and talk to them about it or I'm going to tell them to do the same. So I think that's the big message is, is communication. We need to talk about it as a society. We need to talk about it as athletes, as schoolmates, as workmates. I mean, it's so prevalent in the workforce too where that stigma exists there as well and in our communities and the more we break it down and get people comfortable with the terms and sharing that feeling and the feelings you have inside the more we'll break that stigma down to a point where we can feel everybody can feel comfortable coming forward with that i mean and i've said you know if, if i had a heart problem i have no problem telling you i went to the doctor about my heart but yeah. if i have something wrong with my head we're reluctant to tell me, you know what, there's uh, I had to go see my doctor about the way I'm feeling in my, in my head today. And we, mm -hmm. there's a, that's that stigma, that breakdown that occurs. So we need to get to that point. And then the other thing I would suggest that benefited me a, a great deal is seeking the medical holistic intervention. So mm -hmm. I started with my family practitioner who got me to a psychotherapist. I tried a psychologist that didn't work for me. But I tried a social worker, which I got good results from. And then I went to my naturopath who helped me work on my diet. Huge changes when I worked on my diet. Sure. 
and then just general exercise, which, you know, getting out, being active also helps. So I use that holistic approach to improve other facets of my body that made my head feel better as well. Thank you so much. And if people need to reach out and find a copy of your book or order a copy, where can they get that? So currently it's at Wordsworth Books in Waterloo, mm -hmm. um, Merrifield Bookshop in Woodstock, uh, Fanfare in Stratford, Looking for Heroes in Kitchener. And if you like, it's also on Amazon through uh, in paperback and Kindle versions. And a uh, very exciting, last fall, I recorded the Audible version. Okay. So I also have it uh, available through Audible and iTunes. And that was a great experience as well, being able to uh, read my story. and have it. In a, so it's available in Audible as well. So, yeah, it's been a, a remarkable 12 months. And, uh, and it continues. What's next for Steve Seftel? Well, what I wanted, what I'm really hoping to do now is get into the public school systems. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start locally. So last, uh, in 2020, on Bell Let's Talk Day, back in January, I went to St. Clement's School, a Catholic school in, over in St. Clement's, Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I spoke uh, on Bell Let's Talk Day to the school in the, at an assembly in the gymnasium. And it was excellent experience. So... I've contacted the local school boards and there's a vetting process that has to take place. Mm -hmm. And my goal is uh, to, to go out to schools and in the region here and, and be a, a public speaker on mental health and wellness and share my story and, and talk to the, the next generation coming up behind us. I think that's a, a big part of, of breaking the stigma starting with our youth and making them comfortable as they uh, thank you for doing what you do oh well i i certainly enjoy it um i coach minor hockey as well in waterloo i love seeing the smiling faces when they come in the rink i know your son plays hockey he and does. he's a goalie and i could see it when i met him the, mm -hmm. the smile on his face so i love seeing those smiling faces because there really is a joy to about playing the sport mm -hmm. and I love seeing that. And I, along the way, I lost some of that, but I have rekindled it by just being around the young athletes and, and seeing how excited they are to come to the rink and how excited they are to get on the ice. And Great. it brought back some of the fun for me. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve, for sharing your journey with us. And it was a pleasure to have you here and wishing you the very best. And your book is fabulous. I would suggest anyone listening to definitely get a copy. It's called The Shattered Ice, and you can get it online on Amazon. And Steve has shared where you could reach out and uh, get it from different stores as well. So, again, thank you so much for being here today. It was a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you for having me. It's been a wonderful experience, and I'm glad we got together. Take care.